Our gospel lesson comes from the Sermon on the Mount today. These are the words of our Lord Jesus Christ as he took his disciples aside and apart and the crowd followed. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, or about your body, what you will wear. It's not life more than food and the body more than clothing. Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life, your span of life? And why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not clothed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Therefore do not worry, saying, What will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear? For it is the Gentiles who strive for all these things, and indeed your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But strive first for the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. We're going to pretend you're the 930 crowd, which means if I ask a question, it's not rhetorical this morning, you get to answer back. If you had... 20 minutes to leave your home, aside from money and food and your documents, things like that, what would you take with you? You can only take what you can carry. What would you take with you? Bible? Okay. Neil said that to score points with the pastor, right? No. Just kidding. Just kidding. What would you take? Medicine? Okay. What else would you take? Pets. Hmm? What was that? Did you say your wife? Talk about scoring points. That one was definitely pictures. Your phone. Um, a friend of mine says, your problem, Terry, is that you're a news junkie. No, I'm not a news junkie, but in my line of work, I feel that I need to watch the news regularly because I need to know what's going on, because our lives intersect the lives of the rest of the world. Our faith does as well. What was that? Your pets, Your pets yes. Now, I was reminded of a scene in the horrifying movie Schindler's List, a movie made in black and white except for one brief moment of color. You remember what that was? The little girl in the red coat. He saw her walking and then later saw her not walking. I was watching the news and I saw a little kid in a pink jacket with a hood and a purple cap and scarf and purple boots in Ukraine, almost identical to one of the kids in our preschool who was all dressed up to go home the other day in the same outfit. And then I saw the most horrifying thought of all to me, someone who looked so much like my mother being picked up and put in a shopping cart and pushed down the road. We're living in scary times, folks. And believe it or not, I picked these passages, which are off the lectionary a bit, before the war started, before Russia attacked. And here we read the words of Jesus, don't worry. Don't worry about what you're going to eat. Don't worry about where you're going to live. Don't worry about your body and your clothing. How many of you are worriers? Raise your hand if you're a worrier. I've often said my greatest spiritual failing is my ability to worry. Some of you are looking like, oh yeah, I know where you live. We've got to take these passages, though, and see what Jesus is saying to us today. He's saying to that crowd so long ago. And what was that crowd like? His disciples, he had called them apart. He had just finished calling them. This is early in Matthew's Gospel. The Beatitudes were just read when he says, Blessed are you, blessed are you, blessed are those who weep, blessed are those who mourn, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. And now he's saying to them, this is how you live that out in the world. You don't worry about things. They'd left behind everything. They were poor people for the most part, other than the tax collector, and he left behind his tax collecting ability, which meant he left behind that money, that power that he had absorbed for himself by cheating his fellow Jews. They're poor and they're hungry and they don't know where their next meal is coming from and he says don't worry to them. Hard words today, aren't they? So let's look at what Jesus is saying 
to them in light of what Moses brought down the hill from God. You know where the passage from Exodus comes, Exodus 20, the Ten Commandments, the first of which is God saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. No other gods before me. You shall make no idols for yourself. Now I know none of you have a carved bar of soap at home that looks like a dinosaur or whatever and you don't bow down to it and pray every day, right? If you do, call me up because we've got to talk. But we have idols, don't we? We have things that get in the way. What are some of our idols? Again, not a rhetorical question. What are some of the things that we turn to before we turn to God? What was that? The TV. Yes, indeed. What else? Money and security, right? We clamor after security, thinking it's going to come through the bank account sometimes. What are some of the other things that we idolize? I've often said, we don't need to be threatened with a nuclear bomb. All we need to do is have our AC and our Wi-Fi turned off and we'll cave. Because how many people are addicted to their telephones right now in the world? And the internet, and being able to get information very quickly. Or games, or cars, or any kind of thing that takes our hearts and our minds from God. Those are the things that get in the way. And God says, I'm jealous. Put me first. But it's so hard to prioritize, isn't it? Last week we talked about the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness. We talked about the temptation of Adam and Eve in the garden. We talked about how things get in the way, which is why I entitled the sermon, in case you missed it the first time. We're talking about putting first things first, and it's hard to set our priorities sometimes, isn't it? Because we are people who worry. We worry about the future. We worry about the present. We worry about those we love. We worry for ourselves. How many of you are worried that a NATO nation might be the next to be attacked, which would bring the United States into this conflict as well? And this is the greatest humanitarian crisis since World War II in Europe. Because so far, nearly two and a half million people have crossed the borders out of Ukraine, over half of them children. And if it's not bad enough to think about people being refugees from their homes and their homeland and everything they've ever known and loved, I think the difference here, we see war in different parts of the world. We saw Aleppo and Syria and we saw things like that and they didn't hit us like this because these people look like us, don't they? Like I said, the same exact outfit worn by a little kid in our preschool, worn by a child there. These are middle class suburban people who have not known, most of them, anything like this before. And now there are human traffickers on the border welcoming people across. But I want us to focus on what else is being done. I saw an interview with the head of an NGO, a non-governmental organization that is working to provide sustenance for these refugees. He said we can care for a thousand people a day, which is great. A thousand people a day, that's a lot. But there were 125,000 people in line at that particular crossing point. But you know what's happening there? People are opening their homes. They're taking in strangers. Some at the risk of their own security and safety. They're taking in people who don't even speak their language because they are clothing themselves with compassion. They're clothing themselves with kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. They're bearing with one another. That's what Paul wrote to the church in Colossae. Bear with one another, and if anyone has a complaint against another, forgive each other just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive. Above all, clothe yourselves with love which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which you indeed were called in the one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teach and admonish one another in all wisdom, and with gratitude in your hearts, sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. We have that power at our fingertips. We just have to learn to claim it and use it. 
We have the power of God at work in our lives. We are stronger than we know. And God who brought us out of slavery, maybe not in Egypt, maybe not even the American slave trade, which some folks in our community, if not in our congregation, are descendants of that horrendous practice. But God has freed us from slavery to sin, slavery to despair, because I think if there's anything that gets in the way of a Christian and God, it is the sin of despair. I'm not talking about depression. I'm not talking about a physical reality. I'm talking about giving up hope, which we can do if we let ourselves be overcome by the world. You heard of compassion fatigue. Remember how at the beginning of the pandemic, everybody was happy to be home with their families. Yay, we're all here together. Some of you are like, I don't know. You live in a house full of men, Toby. You're looking at me like, was that a good thing? Momentarily. Remember all those lovely videos people made of their families singing about the pandemic and being together? Remember how people used to stand on the streets and applaud the healthcare workers going to work? Now they're swearing at them. Now they're punching out flight attendants because we all get really tired and overwhelmed and beaten down by the world sometimes. I can tell you this morning when I was out there with my cane scraping ice off my car, I was praying and crying and sometimes saying words that were not appropriate to either God, this church, or prayer. We all get overwhelmed. We are all sometimes beaten down by the world, but we have to keep our hope in Jesus Christ. I put a picture on Facebook yesterday, some of you commented on it, of the snow up against my screen. You couldn't even see through it. And this morning when the snow was off the screen, I have icicles this big. They could kill a person. But you know what I see out there in my yard? I hear birds singing. And my daffodils, which were blooming, are still going to be there under the snow when the snow melts. We've got to hold on to the hope that is ours in Jesus Christ. We have to stand in the world and say that we will put God first. We will remember and we will be thankful and we will sing. It's not always easy to sing. Because if we stay on our own, in our own individual little families, in our own little enclaves, or by ourselves, we forget the power that is ours when we join our hearts and minds and our voices together. Because we do have a God who hears us, a God who loves us, a God who rescues us, a God who redeems, a God who saves, a God who empowers. So pray for the people of Ukraine. Pray for Vladimir Putin. I make myself pray for him five times a day that God will reveal himself to him in a powerful way that will change his heart. Pray for the President of the United States, especially if you didn't vote for him. If you think he's doing a lousy job, pray twice as hard for him because the man is between a rock and a lot of really hard places right now. Pray for each other in this congregation. Pray for this community. Pray for the world. Pray for peace and work for peace with justice because that is what we are called to do in the name of Jesus Christ. Strive first for the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All these things will be given to you as well. Give as much as you can to help someone else be able to claim that promise of Jesus Christ. One of the things that was sent to you in your e-blast this week was the UMCOR, United Methodist Committee on Reliefs, Ukraine Relief Advanced Special Number. We'll be taking that collection here as well. If you want to give a gift, you write your check to Epworth and you write that number in the memo so that 100% of your offering will go to feed people in another part of the world because that is what it is to clothe ourselves with compassion and kindness, gentleness and peace, to give of ourselves and our resources to help others who are in need. It's a sad day, isn't it? It's a cold day. But the warm days are coming again. I've been amazed at the people of Ukraine, their tenacity, they're going to fight, and their television stations have done something that's been unheard of. The news stations are sharing resources and reporters. They're doing things that just don't seem right. They're teaching people how to make Molotov cocktails. They're teaching housewives how to use weapons. But then they're also having moments of singing 
and moments of poetry, moments of beauty to remind themselves why they're fighting. It could be us. I never say, but for the grace of God go I, because God's grace is with everybody, not just me when I'm doing better than somebody else. But we have to call on the grace of God. We have to call on our inner strength and our love for God's people. That's why we have two gospel lessons really this morning. The one that I read to you and the one that Toby read is our call to worship. One of the scribes came near and heard them disputing with one another and seeing that Jesus answered them well, he asked him, which commandment is first of all? Jesus answered, the first is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And he said to them, there is no other commandment greater than these. Which is why Epworth has a new mission statement. Love God with all our hearts, love others as God loves us, make disciples for Jesus Christ. You have your mission, you have the power, go into the world and live it in the name of your Savior, the Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Savior, our Redeemer, our hope against all hope. Amen. <laughs>